At Lincoln Network, we're focused on bridging the gap between the technology and policy communities and leveraging technology to address public policy problems. Today, I'm honored to be hosting David Walker. President Clinton appointed Mr. Walker in 1998, and he led GAO from that point until 2008. Let's start back in the 1990s. When you received that call from President Clinton, I'd love to hear uh, what you were thinking and what your vision was for leading the GAO. Well, first, I did get a call from the White House, but it wasn't from President Clinton, although he's okay. the one that actually did uh, nominate me, and I was fortunate to be confirmed unanimously by the Senate. Actually, the way this got started was I was a partner with Arthur Anderson, and I had a global responsibility for the human capital strategy practice. And the way that it got started is I used to run the Employee Benefit Security Administration at the Labor Department. Uh, I was appointed to that by Bush 41. And uh, I had some career people from the Labor Department call me up and say, Dave, did you know that this position was open? It only comes open about once every 15 years, and we think you would be perfect for it. Uh, and, uh, and so I thought very seriously about it and, uh, and ultimately decided to throw my hat in the ring. And the reason being is because, you know, GAO is a very unique organization. The Comptroller General position is very unique as well. You know, you have a 15-year term. Uh, you can only be removed by impeachment or joint resolution of Congress signed by the president for specified reasons. Uh, and I've always been very concerned with performance and accountability. And, and so I thought it was a very unique opportunity, although I will tell you, I took a huge hit from a financial standpoint. Uh, and, and a lot of my partners said, how in the world can you do that? Little did I know that several years later, unfortunately, Arthur Anderson would go out of business for nothing to do with me, I can assure you. That's, that's great. Um, when you made that decision, and uh, I uh, admire your, um, your sacrifice for public service, um, what were you hoping to accomplish when you uh, took over the reins at GAO? I had three goals when I became Comptroller General, and I'm a big believer in the rule of three, which means most people can't remember more than three things. And so if you can say it in a clear, concise, compelling fashion, it, it works. Uh, the three things were I wanted to transform GAO to make it a world-class performance and accountability organization that led by example, practice what is preached and was more results or outcome oriented. Secondly, I wanted to help transform the accountability profession domestically in the United States and internationally to try to do the same. And the, the third was not one from the beginning because it really wasn't a, a real uh, pressing issue at the beginning. When I came in as Comptroller General, we had a surplus. We had a surplus for four years, 98 through 2001. And in 2000, when I testified in Congress, we were projected to have surpluses as far as the eye could see. And people were actually worried that we were going to pay off the national debt. Now, I never worried a nanosecond about that, but they were worried about it, right? And so as time went on, the third goal was to see if I could end up getting Congress to make a down payment to be able to put to deal with our structural uh, fiscal imbalance, uh, which you know, was bad when I started doing it, 2003, but it's much, much, much worse now. I'd love to talk to you about that uh, specific topic in a few minutes. Um, before we get there, one question I had was, uh, when you entered um, office, GAO had um, recently suffered some significant cuts to its budget in the Republican revolution of the um, 1994 led to budget cuts that, um, dropped staffing levels at GAO by a significant number, um, I think a couple thousand almost. Did you sense the, the, that reduction in capacity and what was the morale in GAO when you uh, came on board? Well, when I came to GAO, the agency had been downsized 40% in the five years before I came on board. Yeah. In addition to that, they had had a five year hiring freeze, which for a professional services organization is something you should never do, okay? Because you mortgage the future. Uh, and so I knew that, uh, and that, I knew something that the staff and the executives at GAO didn't know, and that was that Congress was still not happy uh, and that they were going to be downsized another 25 to 40 percent unless I transformed the organization. Uh, and so I didn't tell the staff that, quite frankly, because I think it would have freaked them out. All right. But what I did do is I did get focused on what needed to be done in order to accomplish the objective uh, and working with. Uh, GAO executives, uh, advisory council members, employee advisory council members, and others, 
we made a number of steps that, that fortunately were successful uh, that caused the Congress to invest more in us rather than less. Uh, and and those, those transformational changes, you know, according to my successor, Gene Dodaro, who was a full partner of mine back when I was Comptroller General, uh, have stuck. One of the changes that you made that I would have been um, interested in, in looking into was the, the um, beginning of your um, GAO's estimates of uh, annual return on investment. I believe around 1999 that you uh, put out the first report issuing an ROI, both in terms of financial savings to the government, but other government benefits. Uh, can you give us a little background on, on what that meant and what you think that's done for the agency? Sure. You know, I'm a firm believer that attitude and effort matters. Uh, and somebody's got a positive attitude and works hard, uh, I'll give them the extra mile, if you will. But ultimately, it's results that count the most. And when I came into GAO, it was a quality organization. And it was one of the best in the world. And they didn't know that it was in trouble. So I had to kind of build a burning platform. But one of the other things that I found was that it tended to be very process-oriented. Uh, and, and it tended to be more uh, you know, input and output oriented rather than outcome oriented. I had people come to me and talk about the fact that they had worked on a particular project for two years and generated a very thick report that was not the subject of any uh, press activity, no congressional hearings, didn't make any recommendations, and therefore, as a result, it really didn't make a difference, right, even though it might have been very good work. And so I had to basically take a number of steps to try to get the organization to be more future focused and more outcome oriented. And one of that was to change the metrics. And one of the key metrics was return on investment. How much in financial benefits, which is either outright savings or freeing up resources to redeploying to higher priorities, did we achieve uh, each year as compared to our budget for the year? And so that was the ROI. Uh, and the ROI, you know, fortunately with all the transformational changes that we made, increased dramatically during my tenure and it stayed high yeah. uh, since since then because of the transformational systemic changes that we made uh, uh, that could sustain themselves beyond any particular leader. Um, I agree and uh, we have published a report last year looking at um, those reports dating back to 1999. And one of the things that I found was impressive was that over the past uh, nine years since 2012, all of the annual reports have um, estimated a return on investment of over $100 in, in financial benefits to each dollar from Congress. Right. One, of the, one of the questions we have is, uh, to what extent do you think that that's scalable? Um, GAO's budget is um, in the $600 million range. If Congress were to invest significantly more, do you think that, that each dollar would buy another $100 plus in savings? Well, they get, they get to a point where there's a law of diminishing returns, right? And so my view is when you talk about resources for, for GAO, the, the idea is we, we want to link resources to results. And when you look at the return on investment you're getting from GAO, it's an excellent return on investment, especially when you compare it to most other federal agencies, quite frankly, who in many cases don't even have outcome-oriented statistics and don't even attempt to try to calculate ROI. I think what you need to do with regard to resources is – uh, make sure they don't get cut because it would be ridiculous to be able to cut somebody who's generating that type of return yeah. to the extent that you want to provide them with additional resources, do it in the areas most in need, where they're the where there's the greatest opportunity, if you will, where there may be a gap that needs to be addressed. And I think the other thing that you can do is give the controller general more flexibility uh, with regard to the allocation of resources. You know, when I came in, 95% of the work that GAO did was directed by Congress. Uh, and, you know, and my objective was, was to get it to where at least 15% could be directed by the Comptroller General. Now, why do I say that? Because Congress tends to be focused on the here and now. And they also tend to not want to deal with the really difficult decisions. And so you need to be able to have the Comptroller General be able to focus on things that may not be crises now, but could be a crisis down the road if you don't deal with it and to deal with some of the difficult issues that they may be hesitant to deal with. In addition to the um, introducing the ROI estimates, you um, changed GAO's name. What a significant change. Um, can you tell us some background on, on uh, your thinking there and what you were hoping with the name change? Well, the name of the agency when I came in was the General Accounting Office, all right, which was pretty blah, okay. But, but you know, the, 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 the acronym or the brand name was GAO. And I didn't want to touch that, all right? 
But when I got into the job for a little while, it was pretty evident to me that the name was actually a problem because we didn't do accounting other than for ourselves, all right? We were the auditors, we weren't the accountants, okay? In addition to that, uh, most of the people who worked for GAO weren't accountants. Uh, you know, most of them were, you know, social scientists, economists, you know, actuaries, lawyers, whatever. They, they weren't accountants, okay? Although we did have a, a, a large number of accountants. Furthermore, I found that when you were dealing with members of Congress, especially new members of Congress and new cabinet officials, they'd say, why are we, why is the general accounting office doing work with regard to performance? Why is the general accounting office trying to analyze, you know, our efficiency and effectiveness? That has nothing to do with accounting, right? Uh, it also caused us a problem somewhat in recruiting uh, when we were trying to recruit. So for all of those reasons, I felt that it was important to change, but I didn't want to change the acronym. And so what I did, and I engaged with, with the staff and with the executives to try to come up with something uh, we came up with government, which is where we are. We're not general, we're government. We're not in the accounting business, but we are in the accountability business and we're an office, we're an independent office. So government accountability office enabled us to uh, retain the brand name, but was much more directly reflective of who we are, what we did and how we wanted to be received. How was that change received within the building? Always, oh, uh, I, I, majority of the people liked it, but there was, you know, there's always a vocal minority. I mean, you know, who's this guy coming in? We've been the general accounting office since, you know, 1921. If it ain't broke, don't fit suit. But I come back to what I said before, yeah. you know, they didn't realize, they didn't realize that, you know, the, that the agency was in trouble. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when you're downsized 40%, uh, in a five-year period of time and have to impose a five-year hiring freeze, that's a market signal. The client's not happy. And as I told you before, rightly or wrongly, they weren't happy. And, 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 and as I told you before, they were going to be downsized a lot more unless we ended up turning it around. Unfortunately, we did. Working together, we did turn it around. Another question that I have for you um, regards GAO's role in supporting Congress's science and technology capacity. As you know, uh, in uh, 1995, Congress eliminated the Office of Technology Assessment, which had served as a nonpartisan source of uh, science and technology expertise for, for the Hill. Um, you know, since that time, there's been lots of uh, discussion and um, debate about how to fill that gap and how to um, strengthen congressional science and technology capacity, particularly given all that's changed over the past uh, 25 years. Um, at GAO, there was a pilot project that was started during your tenure to um, begin providing technology assessments. And there was some interest on the Hill from some uh, members of Congress to, um, to codify that and to create a center of science and technology assessment led by former member Rush Holt um, and others. Um, and that didn't pan out, but over time, uh, GAO has you know, continued work in that field and recently set up the STAA in 2019 to take on a more active role in science and technology assessment. And it's now as a staff of about 100 FTEs. Can you share some thoughts on you know, uh, how you think that has played out and the, the, the missing role of the OTA and where GAO can fill that gap? Well, I was involved in these discussions. Uh, you know, Congressman, former Congressman Rush Holt was really the point uh, on this. Uh, and uh, my general view then and my, my view remains now is there is a need for this. The need is greater than ever. It's likely to increase as time goes on, all right? At the same point in time, I personally believe the government has too many uh, entities uh, and, and it, there was a logical home for it within GAO. And therefore I said, let's create a unit within GAO that will be focused exclusively on these types of issues uh, to be able to support the Congress in that area. And, uh, and so that has been done. Uh, and to Gene Dodaro's credit, who's now the current Comptroller General, he's not only done that, but he's beefed it up. Uh, uh, and, and so I think the best way to do it is to make sure that it has adequate resources, uh, appropriate staff, uh, but that it remain within GAO. Uh, and then part of the issue is, is to have enough members of Congress that frankly appreciate this. I mean, candidly, there's not a lot of members of Congress that have a big science and technology background. Uh, there's also, I might add on a different note, not enough members of Congress who have a background serving in the military. Uh, and I teach at the Naval Academy. And recently, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, I talked to the NIDS about 
the chair and ranking members for all of the committees that are directly responsible for, for armed services activities, none of them have military experience. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Um, that that's in the House. In the Senate, th there's three that do mm -hmm. uh, out, out of, you know, but, but in the House, none do. You raised the point about um, congressional science and technology expertise. Um, over the, that same period, we've seen some reductions in congressional staff capacity. I'm, I'm a former Senate um, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee staffer. And I saw firsthand how congressional staff are often um, uh, overmatched by agencies um, on some of these issues where you know, staff don't have the resources or, or time um, or expertise in some cases to manage these issues. Do you think that um, uh, the GAO's work in these fields can be absorbed adequately by Congress and the members, and congressional staff? Well, I think, you know, there may need to be some targeted augmentation of congressional staff, but I, mean, I think you're also making an argument for there ought to be a more active participation and partnership between congressional staff and GAO. Congressional staff have limit, limited resources, right? GAO has got more resources. It's got more resources dedicated to this area than it did 10 years ago, and it'll probably have more resources dedicated to this area 10 years from now than it does now. I want to go back to something you raised earlier, and that is the nation's fiscal challenges. It's um, interesting to think back to the late 1990s and the um, surpluses that we're running. Um, as you mentioned, it's we're far way off of that given um, all that's happened, particularly over the past couple of years. Um, in the mid 2000s, you led or were a part of leading the fiscal wake up tour. Can you talk about what you were um, trying to do there and the focus sure. that you put within GAO on trying to address these fiscal challenges? Sure. Uh, first, let me remind you that in, in 2000, we had a surplus. Our total liabilities and unfunded promises for Social Security and Medicare uh, were about $20 trillion. Okay. Uh, in 2003, three things happened that convinced me that uh, Congress had lost control. Uh, and those were, number one, a second round of tax cuts to stimulate the economy that were supposed to pay for themselves, but they didn't. They increased deficits and debt, and they were just, you know. Uh, secondly, we invaded a sovereign nation without declaring a war, Iraq. I said it was going to pay for itself. It cost trillions of dollars and thousands of lives. And thirdly, Medicare was expanded to add prescription drugs and added $8 trillion in new unfunded obligations when Medicare was already underfunded $19 trillion. So that was a signal to me that things were out of control, all right? I did several things. Number one, for the first time ever, and it's continued every year since, there is an emphasis paragraph in the audit report on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government that basically says the United States is on an imprudent and unsustainable fiscal path that tough choices will be necessary with regard to revenues and spending, including social insurance programs, to be able to put us on a more stable path and discharge our stewardship responsibilities, all right? Secondly, I realized that, you know, while ultimately the Congress is the one that has to make the tough choices, uh, Congress is an island surrounded by a sea of reality. Uh, and, you know, and, and for the record, I live just outside the Beltway, so the island's inside the Beltway, okay? Uh, and I realized that you needed to engage the public. They needed to be able to understand the facts, the truth, the need for tough choices. They need to understand where we've been, where we are, where we're headed, how we compare to others, what the consequences are of not acting, what the benefits are of acting, and then what are some of the kinds of things that ought to be on the table that ultimately Congress has to decide. So I started the fiscal wake-up tour with various think tanks. Uh, so uh, very diverse. It was uh, fact, professional, objective, fact-based, nonpartisan, non-ideological, uh, if you will. Later on, that led to uh, doing the film IOUSA, which was a critically acclaimed documentary, um, uh, if you will. It, 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 and I've done things since I left, which we can talk about. Uh, but I will tell you, the peak of concern about this was 2012. And that was the year that uh, I did the 10, 10 million a minute tour to 27 states, 10,000 miles as part of the Comeback America Initiative. The public concern about this is not very high right now. And that's because the politicians aren't focused on it and they don't want to focus on it. Uh, and so I think there's a need to refocus on this. You know, you can issue all the kind of reports you want. You can testify all you want. 
that won't get the job done. That is a piece of a much bigger puzzle. And I think there has to be much more aggressiveness with regard to re-engaging the public on this uh, in order to get the necessary reforms made. You sound a lot like my former boss, um, Senator Tom Coburn. He would- um, Great man, great man. I had a high regard for him, yeah. Me too. Um, it's a, it's, he, he would say that a lot, a lot of folks in Washington need to have a spinal transplant and uh, to focus on these types of issues. Um, but- uh, Well, and Senator Coburn, to his credit, uh, you know, created the statutory requirement for the annual duplication overlap and redundancy report the GAO does, yeah. which, is, which is something we talked about when I was there and as a result of the acquisition reform that started when I was there that's been continued and expanded and has saved between the two of those hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, I, I'm glad you raised that because um, one of the questions I have is in thinking through how GAO can help address the fiscal challenges. I read this, the, the same reports that you're talking about. There's an annual report where the Comptroller General comes before Congress and warns about the long-term fiscal challenges. I'm interested to ask if, if there are ways that GAO could possibly sharpen some of its policy recommendations to be more forceful in um, urging congressional action. Um, so former staffer, there's often a, um, a joke that the GAO reports that we receive often have this progress made, challenges remain on, kind of on the one hand, on the other hand. I can understand why that's necessary to main independence. And, um, but looking forward, are there ways that, um, that you think GAO could be leveraged more like that uh, duplication amendment or other reforms that we should be considering? Well, first, um, you've got to consider that there's uh, a couple of sides to this, one of which is uh, the operations of government. Uh, where you're focused on economy, efficiency, effectiveness. Uh, on that, I think GEO needs to be very aggressive uh, and it needs to be able to make as many recommendations as possible, as specific as possible, and it needs to measure success based upon whether or not they're adopted uh, and what kind of benefits result, either financial benefits, safety, security, privacy, whatever it might be, okay? Uh, but then you've got the policy side, okay? On the policy side, I think it needs to do work, all right? Uh, it needs to, it needs to uh, help to build a burning platform, okay? It needs to help be able to uh, maybe talk about options, all right? Uh, it needs to maybe uh, make recommendations about processes or research that might need to be done in order to effectively address the issue. But in reality, they're not gonna go as far in that area. And that's the reason that I left GAO. Is the reason I left GAO is my view was uh, you can't just, uh, you know, shout the alarm, all right? You, you need to be able to get more specific with regard to what are some of the kinds of things that we need to do in order to solve the problem. Uh, and you need to be careful when you're controller general, when you're GAO, that you don't cross the line to where, in effect, people think that you're getting in, in the policy business, okay? Uh, I will tell you that when I first started raising concern about uh, fiscal sustainability, uh, the chairman of uh, one of the Senate committees asked me why I was involved in that, why I was doing that. Uh, and I said, the reason I'm doing it is because I'm the, I'm the person who signs the audited financial statements of the U.S. government. And if I don't do it, I don't know who will do it. All right. But again, I didn't just put it in a report. I didn't just put it in a testimony. I engaged in a range of other activities that were outside the beltway, again, in a professional, objective, fact-based, nonpartisan, non-ideological fashion. Uh, and, uh, and, and I got more aggressive about potential solutions when I was out of the controller general position because I wasn't constrained. Uh, Understanding that line that JO has to um, delicately balance, um, one uh, recommendation for uh, sharpening or putting more teeth on the recommendations uh, comes from a 2015 report from Deloitte. They urged that um, GAO put deadlines on the open recommendations as a way to expedite the um, implementation rate among the federal agencies. Um, as you know, it takes uh, the four-year implementation rates about you know, uh, 75%. Um, but that takes time. And in terms of getting back to that ROI that we discussed earlier, you know, expediting those uh, actions by the agencies could, could possibly you know, yield a lot of savings. You know, would you support yeah, that? Well, they do, they do age them. 
they do age them. You know, how many have been out a year, two years, three years, four years? That That's really kind of the outer limit is the four years, if you will. Um, yeah. And to the extent that they're, I mean, there are things you, and the other thing they're doing that we started doing when I was there is prioritizing them. Yeah. Because not all recommendations are equal. I mean, I remember having a number of meetings, including with Charles Rosati, who was the first, who was then commissioner of IRS, we had so many recommendations for IRS, there's no way they could deal with all of them. And so we would sit down and we'd talk about which ones are the more most important ones, right? Uh, and then focusing on, on ROI, because ROI is beneficial to everybody, right? It's beneficial to the agency, the partner agency, you know, it's beneficial to uh, the GAO, it's beneficial to the Congress, and it's beneficial to the American people. Um, so, uh, you know, so I think, um, I don't know what else you could do. I mean, I don't know what Deloitte had in mind to do other than what I've just articulated. One of the um, issues we've been discussing with uh, people working in the STAA at GAO is how um, new tools like data analytics and machine oh, yeah. learning could be applied to addressing some of these problems. Do you have any thoughts about, about that? Um, we've been looking at you know, improper payments, for example, the federal government misspends $175 billion per year, uh, $75 billion of which is basically misspent or a loss to the government, according yeah. to last year's report. Um, do you see any hope or promise for using those types of tools? We absolutely positively should be using those tools, all right? Uh, and, you know, the improper payments report that you refer to comes out every year. It's important to understand that improper payments is, is, uh, is not necessarily fraud. In many cases, just mismanagement, duplicate payments, things that were paid for improper, uh, the wrong amount or uh, right. whatever. Um, and clearly data mining, data analytics um, uh, is something that is important to try to deal with that, as well as something that should be able to be used to a much greater extent in doing financial statement audits and, and program evaluations and uh, et cetera. The biggest challenge that I think you have is uh, the condition of the information systems within the federal government. Uh, and I will use the Department of Defense as uh, a prima facie example. Uh, the tail on the dog for getting an opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government is the Department of Defense. The largest entity in the country, if you look at it as an entity by itself, yeah. excluding the entire United States government, you know, over $700 billion a year, okay? Uh, most employees, uh, if you will, they've got thousands of in many cases, outdated legacy information systems that are not integrated. Uh, and that poses a major challenge to do data analytics because you have to have timely, accurate, useful, and complete information in order to be able to effectively leverage data analytics. And so I was on the Defense Business Board earlier. I was recently on it. Now they were trying to redo the whole thing. Uh, and one of the things that we really focused on, how can they end up taking various steps to get where they can do what you're talking about before, you know, before they end up getting the job done on rationalizing all these systems. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely a big challenge. Um, we've heard some promising um, uh, progress being made. Um, we talked with the chief data scientist within the STAA and they're trying a pilot project and working with agencies on payment integrity, but absolutely um, trying to address those, those, Data management. Well, and, and one of the them. first places you ought to start is healthcare. The yeah. biggest, the biggest improper payments problem is in healthcare. Now, why is that? That's where the money is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as we're marking this hundredth anniversary, are there things you hope to see JO do in the the next hundred years? Or um, as we're having discussions with you know, uh, members of Congress and others uh, interested in the agency's future, you know, what do you hope to see? from GAO? Well, I think GAO will become even more important in the future. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I think uh, making sure that they don't get cut, uh, allocating additional resources to them, uh, you know, uh, based upon need and based upon ROI, not across the board, but on a targeted basis. Uh, in addition to that, providing the Comptroller General more uh, authority, more discretionary authority to do work that is, um, you know, that is longer range and more complex, uh, if you will, that tend to not be asked. Uh, I think, uh, but I also think that the GAO needs to get more assertive. Uh, I think the GAO, you, you know, you, you only get so much out of issuing reports. 
You only get so much out of uh, doing congressional testimonies. And by the way, I would say Congress needs to have GAO testify a lot more than they have. They've gone down. Congressional testimonies have gone down. Uh, and so you have to figure out how can you leverage technology? And they are doing something here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they're not. They are. How can you leverage technology uh, to be able to get the message out to a much broader cross-section? Uh, because in the end, a lot of the tough challenges that we have to meet, especially on the policy side, are going to require the public to understand the problem, the need to act, the benefits of acting sooner rather than later, the consequences of not acting, so that the ground can be till, tilled so that elected officials can make those tough choices without fearing loose of their, lo losing their job. And that, that is one of the most important things. And that's why what I say right now, the, probably the three most important things right now, just overall for the government, is one, defeat COVID-19 and learn the lessons from it. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the federal government does not have a strategic plan. GEO does. We did the first one in 2000. You know, uh, it does not have a strategic plan that is future-focused, resource-constrained, outcome-oriented. China's got one, and, that, and they're executing on it, and it's a tremendous competitive advantage for them. And thirdly, we got to recognize that if you don't maintain economic strength, that everything else is going to suffer. Your, your, your diplomatic influence is going to suffer. Your military is going to influence. Your cultural impact is going to influence. It is going to suffer. And so we need to recognize that you know, we're not exempt from the laws of prudent finance. We've got to be able to put our finances in order. We've got to be able to deal with our structural imbalance sooner rather than later. And we've got to rationalize both fiscal policy, which is tax and spending and monetary policy, all right? And the way to do that is to have a new statutory fiscal sustainability commission that will engage the American people with the facts, the truth, the tough choices, listen to them, make recommendations to the Congress on revenues, spending, and social insurance programs, and that will be guaranteed a vote in Congress. That's what we need to do. And, and Congress, and, and, you know, and to the extent that GAO can build support for that in a professional, objective, fact-based, nonpartisan, non-ideological way, that's a plus. These are terrific recommendations. Um, I certainly appreciate them. Uh, it's clear that you've had a, a lasting and positive effect on the GAO and on you know, the federal government as a whole. Um, we're really grateful for you sharing your time with us. Are there any closing thoughts you'd like to, to share with our audience as, uh, as we're marking this anniversary? Well, GAO is a great agency. It's, uh, it is a world-class organization that leads by example, practices what it preach, preaches. We make great, change, um, great and lasting changes at GAO. The accountability profession in the U.S. and internationally is focused both on performance and accountability, you know, oversight, insight, and foresight, which is critically important because we don't do enough foresight work in the political arena, if you will. Uh, and so I, I, I'm looking forward to celebrating the 100th anniversary. I plan to be there. It's going to be in the middle of July. Uh, and, uh, and I, and I uh, congratulate Gene Dodaro, my successor, who was my number two for, you know, continuing the reforms that we made together and, uh, and, and to focusing on continuous improvement. Uh, and last thing is, you know, we're a great country. We've got some serious challenges. You know, we've got serious, we've got increasing security threats increasing gaps in America, a number of sustainability challenges. But the good news is we can solve them if we get serious and if we act sooner rather than later. Excellent closing thoughts. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Walker. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. All, good to be with you.